a, a brief pause in the wonderful conversations that you're having. Good morning and welcome. <clears throat> I think many of you were at the wonderful keynote by Franz de Waal last night and no doubt um, provoked by a number of ideas and we could certainly see in the reception last night lots of great discussions that have already uh, started. So um, my name is George Cheney. I'm uh, director of the Barbara and Norman Tanner Center for Nonviolent Human Rights Advocacy and director of the Peace and Conflict Studies program and a professor in the Communication Department. So welcome to the conference, The Evolution of Aggression, Lessons for Today's Conflicts. Um, I'm going to offer a general introduction and then turn the floor over to my colleague Elizabeth Cashton in just a moment to tell you more about this specific conference, the format, structure, content, and so forth. Um, but first, brief background on the center. Uh, the center was founded in January of 2006. Um, it really grew out of the vision of Barbara and Norm Tanner and their daughter, Deb Sawyer. And a huge part of that vision was to bridge uh, the best in academic research on topics related to conflict resolution, peace, human rights, nonviolence, and security with outreach to the community. So this conference is really a hybrid form in that sense um, that crosses those boundaries. And that's one of the things that we're most excited about. Um, our programs, in addition to this annual conference, which is our biggest event, uh, include the Peace and Conflict Studies minor, which we hope will become a major, an undergraduate major in two years, a K through 12 educational outreach program, uh, the newly launched Utah Citizens Council, uh, modeled on the global group, the elders and other councils of elders around the world, uh, campus community intergroup dialogue program, uh, and a peace library, which has been great fun to put together over the last few years. This is our third international conference. Uh, the first in 2007 was entitled Values and Violence, the Intangible Aspects of Terrorism. And last year in 2008, um, this conference was entitled Migra uh, Migration, Rights and Identities, Examining the Range of Local and Global Needs. There are really several hallmarks to these conferences that I want to mention by way of introduction and, and orientation um, to uh, the next couple of days. First is that we rotate topics from year to year. As you can see already, those first three topics are quite diverse. Um, and next year's conference um, is going to be on um, the oppression of sexuality and implications for fundamental human rights. So, we love the wonderful diversity of these topics, and all of them have grown out of interests already on the parts of groups of faculty and members of the community um, here at the University of Utah and in Salt Lake City. Um, secondly, um, as I mentioned, these bridge um, academic and public discussions, and that's evident in the publications that are coming out of the first two conferences already. In fact, this one just came out of the first conference, Values and Violence, um, and it's edited by three of our faculty members, Ibrahim Karawan, uh, Wayne McCormick, and Steve Reynolds. And so, and there are two subsequent publications coming out of the Migration Conference. We've just learned uh, a book contract uh, with Routledge and also a special issue of the International Journal of Comparative Sociology. So we're very excited about these um, um, publications and particularly the fact that they all include practical and policy implications just as the discussions in the conference themselves do. Um, so uh, finally, uh, another aspect of these conferences is that the, uh, they're far from one-shot events. You know, many conferences you attend, people get very excited, then they go home back to their routines and so forth. These conferences are much more part of a stream of discussions. Um, they arise out of interests that are already present in our academic um, and, and general communities, and they continue by sustaining that interest. And In fact, we've seen the faculty networks on this campus and beyond um, with, with certain kinds of interests, uh, like in terrorism and migration, for example, grow um, as a result of these events. So that's one of the most exciting uh, things about them. 
Um, it, it sounds almost a bit cliche to say this is truly a collaborative enterprise. You hear that at lots of different events, but I mean that very sincerely. And I just want to highlight our co-sponsors, uh, at least right now at the uh, beginning of this conference. They include the Brain Institute, the College of Humanities, the College of Science, the College of Social and Behavioral Science, the College of Social Work, the Department of Anthropology, Department of Biology, Department of Communication, Department of Philosophy, and Psychology. Lisa and Bill Worthlin from our community, the LSB Leakey Foundation, which is based here in Salt Lake, the International uh, Institute for Public and International Affairs, and the Office for the Vice President for Research at the University of Utah. Um, I'll be offering a number of expressions of gratitude throughout the conference, but especially up front, I want to thank um, Alita Tu, our administrative coordinator, and Victoria Medina, program coordinator, whom many of you have already met, who have worked tirelessly in the last few months um, to put this conference together. I also want to acknowledge um, three colleagues, um, a trio of colleagues who represent not just three different disciplines, but three different colleges on our campus who came forth with a vision for this conference um, um, that really is being brought to fruition today. Um, and these are Dave Carrier um, from the Department of Biology, Steve Downs from the Department of Philosophy, um, and as I'll mention in just a moment, Elizabeth Cashton from the Department of Anthropology. Throughout this conference, um, you will hopefully bump into many of the people who are less visible than speakers, um, who, but nevertheless are absolutely essential to making this possible. Um, these include people providing technical support, food services, offering transportation, those who have already assisted us with publicity, such as in university communications. I just ask you to take a moment to thank those folks um, uh, whenever you have that opportunity, because uh, to, to, have, uh, to make an event like this um, run as, as smoothly as it already is, uh, it, it simply couldn't be done uh, without um, that much help. So um, let me now turn the floor um, over to my colleague, uh, the chair of the Department of Anthropology, Elizabeth Cashton, who will tell you more about the events ahead. Elizabeth? So here we are. It's 200 years to the month since Darwin's birth, a fitting opportunity and occasion to explore how the theory of natural selection can help us understand the evolution of human aggression. And so, along with Dave Carrier and Steve Downs, I want to thank Barbara and Norman Tanner, Deb Sawyer, and the staff of the Tanner Center for making this possible, giving us this opportunity. So the aims of this conference then are to understand why and when and what kinds of circumstances bring about human aggression and human reconciliation, what kinds of contexts and circumstances lead to violent or peaceful outcomes. And those circumstances, as we learned last night, include the social context and circumstances and the cultural context as well, clearly. So we assume our, our aim here is to try and apply these general principles that we're going to learn about to better understand how we can intervene, to understand what kinds of policy changes are likely to work. So let me just give you, outline very briefly, the events of the conference. We are going to start with a session on conflict and conflict resolution in primates. Then I hope you'll join us for a keynote by two of the key figures in this field, Margot Wilson and Martin Daly, who will be speaking at noon in the Post Theater, which is just down the road. Follow the herd if you don't know where it is. Uh, we'll reconvene back here for a session on male coalitionary violence and warfare. And then this evening at, what time is it? Uh, 8. 8 p.m. at the Alta Club. Everybody is welcome to join us for a poster session and where we'll explore a lot of these ideas further. Tomorrow we'll meet here again. Uh, the morning session will be about, early morning session will be about hormones 
and dominance and aggression. And then the rest of the day will be on various aspects of domestic violence. We're going to conclude that domestic violence panel uh, series of talks with a community panel where people who are in the trenches dealing with this in our community in Utah will be able to say what they think about how this applies to what they see every day. Does it work? Does it explain things? Are there assumptions we're missing? That sort of thing. So just to conclude then, I want to reiterate one of the things that George just mentioned, which is that while a lot of academic conferences that we go to consist of people, academics talking to each other, basically, this one really is different in the um, attempt with which we want to bring in the broader community. And so in addition to saying welcome to all of you, and I'm glad you're here, uh, just a word to the panelists to remember that you are speaking to a broad and diverse audience. Okay, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Kristen Hawks, who will be the moderator for this session. Thanks. Well, uh, we've already spent a lot of the morning, but it's a beautiful one out there, and there are lots of people who have really interesting things to say. I'm, I'm supposed to be keeping the time, which is going to be tricky. Um, our first speaker is uh, Richard Rangham, who's the... Ruth Moore, professor of biological anthropology and the curator of, of um, primate social behavior at the Peabody Museum at Harvard. And um, this mild-mannered Englishman is, is actually, he's the first guy most of us think of when we think of the evolution of human aggression. So it's really fitting that he's going to be setting the stage for us in um, thinking about the, the larger picture of these patterns of lethal aggression within our order that certainly characterize our species. Um, Rangham is, uh, has been hip deep in these aggression issues, at least since he was a graduate student, um, working with Jane Goodall at Gombe when, when uh, recognizing these, these patterns of horrendous lethality ab among chimpanzee communities first. Um, came to light, and, and then he's gone on to establish study sites elsewhere in uh, Kabali in Uganda, other chimpanzee study sites that are so crucial. So we know some, we know a great deal more about this closest living relative, um, of more about the variability as we see what happens in in different communities. And uh, this work at Kabali has included teaching us all kinds of things about basic primate, primate ecology, not just uh, chimpanzees, but certainly chimpanzees. And he's been involved in figuring out even experimental ways to try to understand what's going on uh, with these patterns of, of lethal aggression and when they occur, and to try to understand how um, capacities like this and tendencies like this evolve, and then the context in which they're elicited. So uh, we, I turn the field, uh, the 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 microphone over to uh, Professor Rangham to uh, get us started. So he gets an extra 10 minutes to um, lay this out for us. Um, Richard. Okay, well, thank you, Kristen, and uh, thank you uh, to the, uh, the Town Board and to the Leakey Foundation, uh, the University of Utah, and uh, all concerned in organizing this. It seems to me simply astonishing how little attention has been paid to the evolutionary biology underlying these incredibly important problems of uh, human violence. I think in October, when the University of Oregon hosted a conference on the evolution of war, it was the first in the history of our species, which seems extraordinarily embarrassing for this particular planet to be so late in uh, getting to grips with the program. I think it's wonderful that people have brought together such a diverse group of people uh, with different kinds 
of views. Um, my heart uh, sank this morning slightly when I saw that I was uh, sitting next to Franz de Waal on the uh, panel. Um, he, he and I tend to have somewhat different interpretations of uh, uh, some of the be behavioral evidence, and um, I, I thought I could see what was coming, you know, because uh, he sat down, and some of the ethologists may have noticed among you that uh, uh, he briefly uh, just, just touched me uh, as he sat down. <laughs> <coughs> I, I, I call that anticipatory reconciliation. Uh, <laughs> but, but he and I both studied chimpanzees, and I was just worried about that mouth-to-mouth -mouth kiss. That was, uh... <laughs> well, actually, he didn't kiss me. And, and the reason he didn't, perhaps, was because although we study chimpanzees, we are humans. And... Um, and many people wonder uh, why, if uh, we're interested really in humans, we bother uh, bringing in data about other species at all. I mean, quite often when there are responses to uh, the material that I write about uh, the relationship between chimpanzee violence and human violence, I see people saying, look, we are not chimpanzees. These chimpanzees are irrelevant. Let's study humans. And of course, at some level, that's right. But chimpanzees can give us ideas. So I just want to respond to the invitation uh, of the organizers uh, for the first few minutes, just to uh, present the way that uh, I, at any rate, see uh, the uh, way in which primatology uh, can, can help us. So essentially what it is, is um, that uh, it does three things for us. So it answers three of um, the questions that the, the great ethologist uh, Nico Tinbergen asked us to answer about behavior. It lets us think about the causal mechanisms underlying behavior uh, possibly being the same in our close relatives and our, ourselves. It gives us ideas about that. It gives us ideas about the adaptive functions, the, the mechanisms by which uh, evolution uh, has, or natural selection, might have favored violence uh, or peacemaking. And then it also gives us ideas about the actual evolution, the, the long-term process, the a uh, possibility that uh, we can recognize uh, when in our ancestry we uh, acquired some of these uh, more startling patterns. So uh, to try and <coughs> sort of put flesh on some of these ideas, uh, we can take a, a bunch of, of human behaviors uh, like these. Uh, some of them uh, nasty and, and some of them uh, a lot uh, nicer and more encouraging. And... Uh, uh, we may find that uh, some of these occur in primates and some of them do not. And when they do not, then sometimes we're reduced to saying, okay, we just got to think about those kinds of problems independently of uh, the uh, comparative animal background. Uh, sometimes there are other species more remotely related to ourselves that do show some of these things. I don't know of any primate that shows anything like gang rape. Uh, you can find something a little bit equivalent uh, in, in ducks. I'm not sure, actually, in that case, that there's much to be said about the comparison. But um, nevertheless, uh, there are possibilities here. But we're focusing here on primates, and so uh, we can look at a series of behaviors uh, where uh, there is something uh, potentially in common between primates and ourselves. Uh, just possible. They give us ideas about the way the system might have worked. Now, the reason that this is important is because many of us are old enough to have grown up at a time when it was thought that these kinds of violence did not occur in animals at all. And we had no models to help us, to guide us about the way that evolution might have led to the behaviors that we see in ourselves. And then... Uh, Perhaps uh, infanticide, which has uh, embarrassingly slid left off the slide here, um, but uh, was actually intended to be the, the uh, top uh, example here, uh, was one of the classic examples that Sarah Hurdy, who is here, uh, worked on and showed occurs in animals in a way that uh, is fully explicable uh, through uh, principles of natural selection and sexual selection. And to some extent, some of the cases of infanticide in humans can be understood in parallel ways. Well, um, I'll be giving examples uh, of that. I just want to point out that even nowadays, the notion that there are important uh, continuities or similarities between primate behavior and human behavior is not always taken very seriously. Here is David Barash, a, a, a very uh, distinguished uh, evolutionary biologist, writing about uh, humans, saying we're animals, and as such, we're subject to a diverse array of evolutionary constraints. 
But phylogenesium's remarkably unimportant. And, uh, and he really laid this out uh, very clearly. Uh, highly questionable whether human beings carry a significant primate legacy at all when it comes to behavior. And you might think, well, this is ridiculous. I'm just picking on some sort of uh, relatively uh, remote, actually, it's not that remote, but uh, one particular individual and still quoting him out of context. But look, uh, remember uh, the great Ed Wilson, uh, my friend and colleague. He writes uh, on human nature. And he never looks at the evolutionary continuities with ourselves and primates at all. Because what all these people are doing is they're taking general principles of natural selection of the way that we expect that males will react to females and females will react to food and uh, all of the sort of basic stuff that one learns in uh, Behavioral Ecology 101 and just applying them in general. The ultimate irony was Jared Diamond's book where he says, hey, guess what? We just discovered that chimpanzees and humans are so closely related to each other that we might call humans the third chimpanzee. And he just lays that out beautifully and, and shows us exactly how closely related we are. And then he says, well, now let's think about human behavior. And never mentions chimpanzees again. We do not see the comparisons laid out. <laughs> so uh, partly maybe because we haven't known enough about the data and partly because uh, of uh, old uh, traditions, uh, it's not, in fact, been a way that we tend to think about the evolution of uh, human behavior, to think clearly about our relationship with our relatives. But if we look at... Uh, here, a particularly uh, nicely uh, worked out example in macaques, we can see that closely related species do tend to behave in similar ways. There is a phylogenetic trace. And if it happens in other clades, why should it not happen in our own? The peaceful versions of uh, macaques tend to be related to each other. The aggressive versions of macaques tend to be related to each other. Now, this question has no more... Uh, sort of salience for ourselves today than um, the issue of chimpanzees and bonobos. And last night, my friend and colleague, Franz Duval, uh, produced an opinion about uh, uh, bonobos and chimpanzees. He said, look, everyone's focused on chimpanzees, and he thinks this is because uh, we uh, want to present a bloodthirsty view of our evolutionary past, something like that. Um, but why, doesn't people, uh, why don't people pay more attention to bonobos? They're equally closely related to us as chimpanzees are, and bonobos are famously uh, less aggressive. They are territorial. They will wound each other in battles. They do fight over uh, their uh, community ranges uh, in the wild, but they do not go out and uh, commit lethal aggression so far as we know, and they certainly have no, shown no uh, interest in uh, looking for opportunities to do so, unlike chimpanzees. So let me give you the reason why I think that um, the uh, uh, chimpanzees are... Um, of special salience uh, uh, to us. Here's another example, Les Sponsor saying the, quote, scientists uh, who favor the Hobbesian view of human nature downplay the evidence of the peaceful bonobos. This is, this is quite a, an issue for people grappling with the question of how we use the evidence from uh, these two close relatives of ourselves. Well, here is the, the basic uh, uh, logic that sets me thinking that if we want to think about evolutionary continuities in male aggression, then chimpanzees are more relevant than bonobos. The reason is that we see aspects of anatomy of bonobos that are correlated with behavior in other animals that we can trace as being uniquely derived to bonobos and not in the remainder of the hominoid line. So they have cranial reduction. They have pedomorphic, meaning juvenile-looking crania. They have gracile limbs, narrow limbs, and they have small teeth compared to chimpanzees and compared to all of the other great apes. These, this pattern of anatomy is unique, and it looks derived. It's possible that all the other great apes were like that in their ancestry, and then they all suddenly went in the opposite direction, but it's obviously much more likely that bonobos themselves were the ones that took this special path. So, you see here Brian Shea's classic picture looking from above on uh, skulls of an adult chimpanzee on the left, an adult bonobo on the right. The bonobo has got a much smaller head. Uh, on the right, you see a graph which shows that uh, as the body gets bigger uh, and the adult uh, on the right, then the chimpanzee uh, length of the skull is considerably longer than the bonobo. The bonobo has a very small head. It could be called the pygmy-headed chimpanzee, not the pygmy chimpanzee. And here you see a recent analysis using the, uh, the latest and the best uh, way of looking at the changes in shape 
of the skulls. And uh, with this geometric morphometric analysis of uh, Dan Lieberman and colleagues, uh, what they show is that uh, the essential shape of the bonobo and the chimpanzee is the same, but the bonobo is developed later than the chimpanzee. This is evidence for it being a juvenilized form. The adult uh, bonobo has a skull a bit equivalent to a six or seven year old chimpanzee. Now, so here if we think about the uh, evolution of the species of chimpanzees and bonobos and the great apes, the most likely thing is that uh, it's the um, uh, common ancestors that have got the, the large head and the, the thicker limbs that are characteristic of chimpanzees today, and bonobos have been a derived uh, late uh, addition to this evolutionary scene. I've put the humans in um, magenta there to acknowledge that in recent evolution, thing, weird things have happened to humans, and that's a fascinating story that I wish we had another uh, hour to talk about. So the idea is bonobo morphology, it's evolutionarily derived, and is the behavior also derived? Well, in domesticated animals, reduced aggression in domesticated animals is linked to the same suite of characteristics that we see in the bonobo, cranial reduction, pedomorphic crania, gray style limbs, and small teeth. So it is a fascinating speculation to think that these things are linked in ontogeny, and that when you select against reduced aggression, then you select uh, inadvertently, as it were, for a whole series of other anatomical characteristics. Now, that is why I think that bonobos are um, a, a relatively late addition to the ape evolutionary uh, tree. But it is possible, <coughs> as shown on the left here, that you've got a couple of reversals of the pattern of cranial pedomorphism and everything else. So all I can say is that bonobos are probably derived with respect to reduced aggression. We do not know for certain. So the evolutionary question remains speculative. Bonobos, they're very likely derived and have a unique behavioral pattern. I just want to leave it at that. We cannot know. But ultimately, the reason that these species are so critical and fascinating to us is that they're equipped with much of the same neural machinery as we are, and they provide us with opportunities to get at the causal, the mechanistic, and the adaptive questions. That's where the parallels are really most useful in violence and nonviolence. I think of the notion that the, the violence of chimpanzees and the violence of humans go back to five or six million years as a uh, a likely thing that is a, is a good attention grabber to get people thinking about the seriousness of this, but we do not know it for certain. Ultimately, the important questions are going to be related to the adaptive and the mechanistic issues, to which I now turn. I think I said to Dave Carrier and Elizabeth Cashton that I would entertain a question or two here in case I have not made myself plain or in case I have aroused people to the point where they need to express themselves. <coughs> you. <coughs> okay, well, let, let, let me plunge onwards um, and, um, and talk about chimpanzee violence with the notion that um, the discovery of this uh, set of behaviors was the first time that we had an opportunity to reflect on a possible evolutionary model for uh, the development of uh, patterns underlying human warfare. And so uh, I personally uh, think of it as something we need to take very seriously. It doesn't mean that we have to be committed to the notion that humans show the same kinds of patterns, um, but uh, uh, we need to explain why it is that we only still know of two species in which males tend to live in small groups with their closest relatives, and they are humans and chimpanzees, and in which they tend to go out and um, attack members of neighboring groups and kill them. So I want to spend most of the time thinking about chimpanzees and then have a little bit of uh, time left for thinking about hunters and gatherers. So I started uh, feeding behavior uh, because life is mostly a search for energy, and it seems to me that if you really want to get to understand what this is all about, you have to understand how it makes a living. And I was in Gombe in the early 1970s, at the time when, for the first time, we were, <clears throat> as a research team, going out with the chimpanzees from the area where Jane Goodall had uh, seen her uh, chimps at close quarters by giving them bananas, 
and following the chimps now, everywhere they went. And for the first time, we saw that they came up against invisible boundaries, boundaries where they would meet other chimpanzees. And we saw battles. Those battles consisted normally of very mild behavior. Uh, three or four chimps on our side, five or six chimps on their side. Uh, they shouted at each other, they charged a little bit, and then uh, the uh, side with a smaller number <coughs> runs away. Sometimes they can be more prolonged and exciting. And uh, uh, anyone here who's been in a, in a battle that lasts 45 minutes with uh, 15 chimpanzees uh, all continuously screaming uh, is hardly a moment's uh, silence. Uh, with uh, repeated forays made by small coalitions on one side or the other as they uh, dare rush 15 yards forwards to make a slap at uh, a chimp on the other side and then come back again. We'll know what I'm talking about. It is incredibly arousing. Uh, they are excited, we are excited, and it all looks as though, hey, it's kind of ritualistic and that's kind of fun, and uh, uh, then they all go home and, uh, and talk about what a great afternoon they had. <laughs> but um, then in January 1974 came... Uh, this first uh, startling observation of uh, chimpanzees um, moving out of the central part of their range and uh, going for uh, a walk to the edge of the border. On the top left-hand picture there, you see two chimpanzees who are sitting in a non-food tree. They don't often climb non-food trees, but they've climbed a non-food tree to sit on the top of a ridge and just look out, look out over, you know, the Utah Basin and... Um, I, they, they sit there and very often they see nothing and sometimes they do see something, in which case uh, maybe uh, they will see a small party of chimpanzees and they call each other and there's a, a minor battle and they run away again. But then sometimes they see the thing on the bottom left, which is a lone individual, and that's when they can go into hunting mode and stalk that individual. And sometimes they can get close enough. And in January 1974, for the first time, a party of chimpanzees was seen getting close enough to grab the victim before they could run away and pin them down and um, beat him up so badly that he died a few days later. And then it turned out that this was a regular thing. Now, um, in uh, the 1990s, a number of us wrote papers saying, well, it sort of looks as though we can explain this pattern. And the essential point is uh, that you have to have a massive imbalance of power, an imbalance of power so great that when the attack occurs, the attackers are able to do lethal damage to the victim without themselves getting hurt at all. So it's a very low-cost behavior. And we produced this idea that the ecology of this species just happens, for independent reasons, to lead to a system of fission-fusion grouping where sometimes you have small groups and sometimes you have large groups, and sometimes the small groups get on all the way to a single solitary individual. And that means that sometimes you can have imbalances of power. One community might have dreadful food this year, and uh, they're forced to forage alone. The other one happens to have a good food supply, and it can mount big parties, and they can therefore meet the other ones in the border area uh, alone, and uh, that's how, where you have imbalance of power. Low cost, lethal aggression. And what is the putative consequence? The putative consequence is that they remove a warrior in the neighboring group, and that means they're going to get increased dominance in relationship to that group when they meet them in battles. And as they win battles more and more often, because they've got more on their side, they get a larger territory. And that means they get all sorts of benefits. It might be more food. It might be that there's so much extra land that other females will come in and join them. That's the idea. I want to give a little bit of the evidence uh, showing uh, the state of the hypothesis now uh, 15, uh, almost 20 years later. Uh, first of all, it's very clear that um, the chimps are very sensitive. This is not a, uh, a, an argument about um, sort of instinctive, automatic behavior. They're very sensitive to context. And uh, so what you see here is that when the males are in small parties, they stay in the center of their range. They know it's dangerous on the edge. Uh, they only visit the edge when they're in bigger uh, groups. And females don't do it very often. And uh, Mike Wilson is here. Uh, you can ask him about it, but uh, uh, he did these lovely experiments where he played back the calls of strangers, and uh, uh, then groups of varying size were monitored as they heard the strangers' calls. And the more males there are in the party, then the more ready they are to approach the speaker, and the faster they go, and the further they go in that direction, and the more likely they are to call, and so on. 
The attacks that chimpanzees uh, display, uh, which originally were just described from that one site of Gombe and now being described from uh, five or more sites, uh, are uh, attacks that occur in all sorts of different contexts. Uh, sometimes they occur during border patrols, where they appear to be deliberately looking for opportunities to find members of neighboring groups. At other times, they just happen to be somewhere in the area, and they hear a stranger, and boom, instant reaction, they attack, and... Uh, and this is the result you see on the right. And the striking thing about this is uh, the appalling damage and yet the fact that the attackers do not get hurt. I mean, eventually, presumably, some accident will happen and the attackers will get a little bit hurt. But these immensely strong individuals, uh, three or four times as strong as a, as a human, uh, are rendered helpless because someone can hold one wrist and someone can hold an ankle and someone can hold another wrist and uh, others can uh, rip the thorax out or tear the testes out or uh, put uh, uh, scars uh, all over the front of the body. And uh, the only place that this particular individual uh, who was killed by uh, our chimps, hey, we won, um, is uh, the only place that uh, he was wounded on the dorsal side at all is uh, shown in the top left-hand photograph, which is uh, where the skin had been ripped around his elbow, where a chimpanzee appeared to have... Uh, uh, pinched the skin in his teeth, reared the head back to, to pull the skin uh, back. These sorts of behaviors uh, show very clear intent to kill. Why do they do this stuff? Well, one of the striking things is that so far there is no indication at all that the individuals who do this get any kind of reward other than the pure satisfaction and fun of doing it. They, uh, there is no indication that they get extra matings as a result or that they rise in dominance as a result or that if they don't do it, then everybody will... Uh, uh, I shouldn't tease them. I shouldn't joke about it. That, uh, that there will be any kind of punishment uh, by uh, dominant males or females refusing or anything like that. Uh, it is quite clear that the targets of this aggression are mostly male. Uh, they are mostly um, male victims as adults. They, they may be more, mostly victims as infants, we know that within groups the targets of, of uh, infanticide are mostly males, but uh, here is between groups where the data are less good because very often the infant is not known before the death occurs and then very often it's cannibalized. And we know that uh, in the case of Gombe, um, there is uh, excellent data showing that uh, during periods when uh, the territory was able to expand, then there was reproductive advantage because during the period when the uh, territory expands, uh, the uh, chimpanzees experience more food, and as a result, the females are able to get better food and have babies faster. The interbirth interval uh, falls by almost uh, 50% from uh, six years to, to four years. So having more uh, warriors in relationship to the neighbors means that uh, you can expect to win battles more often and expand the size of the territory, and all sorts of data on chimpanzees show that ex every extra little bit of food matters. Now... There are alternative hypotheses that have been produced from time to time to explain the proximate causes of why is it that chimpanzees go off and do these kills? Could it be just that you know, they like it in general? They just uh, are um, uh, looking for any opportunity uh, to attack? Uh, uh, well, um, I mean, to some extent that's true because uh, uh, it does seem as though, uh, in Lord Acton's words, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and if a, a group meets a lone individual, uh, they will attack them. But there is not a generalized uh, tendency to attack anybody. It has to be a lone individual. Uh, there is uh, not much in information so far about individual personality differences. Uh, at least we can say that everybody joins in these attacks. There's no indication that it is anything to do with mating competition. It's not because there are few females that are oestrous in our community and there's one in theirs that uh, prompts these attacks. It's not because they are stressed in their own community and they need right now to go off and attack. It's not because they are meeting at a particular food tree. The data so far really do, in reviews by uh, Mike Wilson and Jennifer Williams and others, uh, conform to the notion that they're taking advantage of opportunities to remove a rival. They're not the only species. We now know that there are other species, but amazingly, there's very little data on other species. But um, uh, I've, I've lost a picture here of wolf territories in, in Yellowstone, but uh, over the last 15 years in Yellowstone, we have uh, good data on um, the frequency of some of this behavior. Here is, um, uh, from a helicopter, 
uh, an example, actually, of uh, wolves attacking uh, the neighbors uh, and killing a particular individual. I've just been given a 10-minute signal, so we'll move on uh, and just note that um, this is kind of a fascinating context because in wolves, you've got a, a breeding male and a breeding female and lots of adults who are uh, typically relatives who are helping. And uh, the Yellowstone people are saying they know that it's the alpha wolves that tend to be attacked. And those would seem to be the equivalent of the males in chimpanzees because they're the key warriors. Once they've gone, then the pack breaks up and there's chaos and the neighboring pack can take over. 35% mortality estimated in Yellowstone from uh, wolves being killed by their neighbors. Particularly ironic considering that uh, Colin Lorenz used wolves to illustrate uh, the fact that uh, animals do not kill each other. Uh, there have been a, a couple of uh, suggestions that uh, the imbalance of power hypothesis might be an exaggeration for chimpanzees. Christoph Bush's group has said, our general impression is chimpanzees can take large risks in the recent paper, but it doesn't describe any. And I've been carefully through his, uh, his examples, and uh, there's no evidence that they are taking risks. Uh, there was one case of wounding, but as shown here, the wounding was when males on their own side attacked their own females. And it's a, kind of a funny kind of... Um, interaction. And they also say that the aggression might depend on the demographic and ecological conditions of the communities, suggesting that individuals in small communities can attack. Well, yes, they're right, but it conforms to the imbalance of power hypothesis because the individuals in the small communities attack at a time when they're in a larger party than the ones they are attacking. So it's the relative party size that really does seem important. So in summary, I want to say that uh, there's a lot of supporting chimpanzee data for the imbalance of power hypothesis. I don't see any major challenges to it. There's a lot of support from other species. Um, particularly fascinating to me is spider monkeys, because Joe Manson and I mentioned spider monkeys as a place where you'd expect this behavior uh, in 1991. And uh, we're seeing many elements of it uh, in spider monkeys. And watch this space. We might see the actual uh, kill fairly shortly. They're killed within groups. and and they've made these deep incursions, and who knows what's going to happen. Okay. So here are the implications I want to draw. When they do these attacks, they're not getting anything straight away. They, they kill the individual, and then they go home. And they don't know whether there's going to be a payoff. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. There's all sorts of things that could intervene. This suggests to me that the reason they do it is because there is an internal motivation system. It's like sex. We don't know why we have sex. You, know, you don't know, have to know you're going to make a baby. They don't have to know that they're going to get territorial advantage in the long term. But the, the grisly thought is that there is selection that has made them uh, get pleasure out of doing this stuff. And that's sure the way they look. It also suggests that <clears throat> there is a very strong evolutionary psychology tending to set up sharp boundaries between us and them. And... Um, the attacks uh, seem to be directed particularly at the best warriors, uh, so it's a sort of rather refined system of um, intergroup aggression. Okay, well now, um, let me briefly think about the implications of this for human warfare. I think what we have here is basically a model for the way in which natural selection could have favored Equivalent sorts of behavior in war. Now, as Franz said last night, we have to think in totally different terms once we get to um, uh, modern warfare with uh, hierarchical systems and commanders to ordering soldiers into battle. Not as different as he said, I think. Uh, many of the interactions you see in modern warfare involve little imbalance of power interactions. That's the way that the commanders are trying to organize it, and that's the way the soldiers are trying to organize it. But I want to just focus on uh, below the military horizon, where do we have anarchy, where we have groups acting in their own behalf, nobody's telling them what to do. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on about, hey, there are lots of foragers that don't uh, have warfare. But I want to make this point, that if we're going to think about foragers from an evolutionary perspective, hunters and gatherers, we need to think about hunters and gatherers living in a world of hunters and gatherers where they are not affected by the presence of pastoralists and farmers and the modern world intruding and affecting their intergroup relationships. And it's very difficult to do this. You have to really search hard to find cases where there are foragers uh, for whom uh, the modern world has not intruded. 
And uh, where you do, you find, I think, a consistent pattern, which is shoot on sight uh, and uh, persistent warfare with the neighbors of a different tribe. Here is the concept as laid out by Ray Kelly, who has maybe gone further than anyone else in really hammering the nature of warfare in a hunter-gatherer system, the Andaman Islands in the East Bengal Ocean. And he distinguishes very sharply between external war and internal war. External war is war with the neighboring tribe. In that case, the average tribe is 400 people and the average camp is 40 and there are 10 camps in uh, the, the average tribe. You see the, the uh, pictures there. External war is unrelenting. <clears throat> Whenever you see a member of the neighboring group, you try and kill them. That's what you do. You can sometimes have raids. It's extremely rare to have battles because you don't never negotiate with them to be able to organize a battle. What the death rate is from those sorts of things, we have very little idea. And then there is internal war, which is a, an oscillating system of war and peace between people who speak the same language and have the same funeral systems and do everything the same, they're culturally the same, and they can have planned battles, and uh, there the uh, death rate can be low or high. Uh, sometimes you have sort of things like the Civil War, and it's all very nasty. The style of fighting is incredibly chimpanzee-like. This has been known since the 1930s or 40s. Um, uh, here we have an example for the Andaman Islands. Uh, uh, the whole art of fighting is to come upon your enemies by surprise, kill one or two, and then retreat. And that's, uh, this is a very strong generalization. And so can one talk about the imbalance of power hypothesis applying to this sort of system? And very briefly, I think the answer is yes, with modifications. Um, and uh, here we have the ecology uh, going down towards the, um, the same chain of logic. I mean, there's all sorts of other things that happen with humans, but let me just have a couple of quick comments about it. A couple of people have suggested that um, because the patterns of violence are so different for humans and chimps, different logic applies. I don't see why the logic should be different. The group sizes may be much greater that uh, humans can sometimes mobilize. The, uh, the way in which they can surprise them, each other by... Uh, uh, burning a hut down at dawn uh, might be different. Uh, the tactics are different. But the essential principle is the same, which is uh, the attackers should have a very low risk of being killed themselves. Unfortunately, we don't know too much about that, how often the attackers themselves would have got killed. Secondly, uh, particularly with internal war, all sorts of new complexities can arise. Polly Wisner, who's here, uh, has documented this in New Guinea. Uh, they may be fighting for a complex of uh, balance of power uh, rather than uh, to win access to land. So things are more complicated. And thirdly, remember that I said in chimpanzees, there is no evidence that the chimps get any kind of reward other than the satisfaction of beating someone to a pulp. Well, in humans, there's lots of discussion in the literature, I'm sure we'll be hearing it uh, today and tomorrow, about the notion of war involving self-sacrifice, altruism, heroism. So I want to present the idea that the way we should think about the uh, essential uh, framework of human violence building on a chimpanzee-like system is that the biology is similar, that we have a sort of chimpanzee-like imbalance of power hypothesis applying where humans indeed have the same probable internal reward system, a pleasure at beating up on someone who you have internally classified as the enemy, period. And now we have, on addition to that, a cultural reward system, as well as the development of a, of a new kind of moral system, which leads to human-style war in the sense that people start taking more risks. And uh, Luke Luaki, who is here, has a poster showing that the rate of death from warfare in small-scale societies is correlated with the presence of such cultural reward systems. So in sum, um, I want to suggest that uh, for external war, you have something rather like the imbalance of power system as applies to chimpanzees when we think about humans. That the main engagements are imbalances of power. It's a shoot on sight system. You automatically kill. The outgroup is a different moral community. And I think of this as a plausible model for the sort of basis of human war psychology. And then internal war uh, intervenes, and um, uh, then you get all sorts of complexities that we need to uh, pay attention to. Now, 
um, it was said to be time, but I just want to uh, add one point, which is that we're asked to think about the sort of wider implications of this. I think the wider implication is this. It is not good enough to say, well, no, we're not natural warriors, we're basically peaceful. I think there's lots of evidence that people under all sorts of circumstances, when they have um, uh, some kind of tension with neighbors, will spontaneously attack and be ready to kill them. And once you see people as uh, natural warriors, then it changes the way you behave in relationship to human behavior. If the default condition under anarchic circumstances is that people are dangerous to each other, then you do what Jane Goodall has done, which is devote her life to saying you really need to be peaceful. My two most important advisors were David Hamburg and Robert Hind, who were both there at the time that the chimpanzee violence was emerging. And David Hamburg has done as much as anyone on earth to prevent deadly conflict because he sees in his book, Preventing Genocide, the importance of recognizing the fundamental dangers in uh, the human psychology. And Robert Hind, as chair of the Pugwash Group, has uh, fought uh, desperately for peace and against nuclear weapons. I think that once we realize the potential that humans have for uh, all of the uh, unpleasant aspects I've been talking about, then it means on the one hand you can say, well, look, the imbalance of power hypothesis says that we should be acutely sensitive to context. We will not be aggressive if the conditions are right, if there is a stable uh, balance of power. And, uh, uh, and uh, secondly, that um, what it tells us is we should be really working hard to make sure that we don't allow imbalances of power to happen. Thank you. So, so the question is, is whether or not, um, if, if this sort of thinking is right, uh, there has been in human evolution a uh, selection in favor of uh, advanced weaponry and maybe even anatomy that would give us, um, as it were, military advantage over our neighbors. Right. And that seems to me entirely reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the classic security dilemma is that if others are going to attack you, then you need to be more powerful than them, and therefore selection favors anything you can do to be able to... Um, to defeat or protect yourself from the enemy. Exactly. Right. And um, uh, so uh, that principle seems to me right. Uh, you know, putting flesh on it seems to me difficult. Um, you know, if you're going to argue it in terms of bipedalism, you probably find a lot of people who challenge that particular idea. But the essential notion that uh, maybe uh, living in groups as large as possible are uh, important in order to be able to be as effective militarily as possible, you know, that's something that many people certainly entertain. So with the chimpanzees, um, the, uh, it's fairly easy. Uh, the, the males have uh, positive affiliative social relationships with uh, a certain set, and there's another set that they absolutely don't at all. But in fact, there was a fascinating sort of fluidity in, in uh, one case where one group divided into two, and uh, so group one ends up killing the males in group two, even though they had known them very well. And at that point... Uh, they had been separate for a couple of years, and they occupied different areas. And how exactly they know, uh, you know that they have reached the point where it's, they're worth killing? Fascinating question. In the case of the Andamanese, then they're, they're speaking different dialects or, or languages. And, um, and, and there'll, be, there'll be little minor differences that they can recognize in um, uh, probably uh, uh, 
and decorations on their body, that sort of thing. But of course, you know, the, the question you're asking is, is totally key to understanding what we do with these sorts of ideas, because um, I think that one concept that is reasonable to entertain nowadays is that essentially all war is internal. The whole human species is a single group. I mean, when, uh, when we see the fight between uh, Israel and, uh, and the Palestinians, then the whole world, or you know, many people in the world, want to intervene. This is not two groups that are not communicating. They're communicating tremendously. And the, the whole evolution of, of war rules happens in the context of internal war. Occasionally, you get external war, like the attack on 9-11. But to a large extent, we are dealing in a world in which uh, the uh, nature of the in-group, out-group boundaries has been reduced to a whole series of complicated in-group relationships. Very interesting. So the, the all conversations about all this will, will continue. And I'm sure our next speaker will also provoke you. So Professor John, Joan Silk, who's uh, at, at um, UCLA, has uh, spent her career trying to understand social behavior in primates and how social relationships are constituted and maintained. And she... So when Joan stands up in her crutches, if I say this is the methodological gorilla, <laughs> you can appreciate, I mean her careful concern with what is it we really know from our experiments and our observations. Uh, do we know what we think we know? And I assume some of those things will be what she'll talk about here. Joni. someone else's talk. I think I'll try that. No, here comes mine. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Okay. So it's a pleasure to be here. This is an incredibly beautiful city, and it's great to be back amongst um, many old friends uh, who happen to be uh, congregated here this weekend. So this is a great pleasure. So um, I have a slightly different title. When Liz uh, asked for a title, I was still um, more preoccupied with the, uh, the maladaptive consequences of being bipedal than I was with uh, this particular talk. But, um, so now I have a, a better title. So I want to talk about the role of conflict, promises, and trust in primates. And I hope you'll see the relevance of this to the larger question of violence and aggression in human societies as we proceed. So I want to make a couple of points. The first point is that conflict is omnipresent in uh, animal societies. Um, the threat of conflict produces a certain amount of uncertainty and anxiety uh, within social groups. And what I'm going to call peaceful promises uh, create um, a certain amount of trust among group members. Uh, this enables uh, uh, affiliation and also functions in resolving conflicts. Okay. So as Franz said last night, within group conflict is fairly common in animal groups. It stems primarily over um, competition over access to resources. Access to resources necessary for individuals to reproduce successfully. Resources are always limited. Um, uh, individuals compete for access to the resources they need to be able to reproduce, and that kind of competition can take various different forms. It can be scramble competition, which I like to tell my students is, uh, think about the piñata, what happens when you uh, break open the piñata and all the candy falls to the ground. Uh, you don't worry too much about other people. You just try to gather up as much as you can. It doesn't really help to go beat on somebody because in the meantime, somebody else got all the candy. Then there's contest competition, which is uh, the human equivalent or the preschool equivalent is musical chairs. It matters a lot what other people are doing so that you need to end up in a chair when the music ends. 
Okay? And sometimes uh, the outcomes of contest competition can be reflected in dominance relationships. So here is a female langard who's supplanting another female langard. Okay, so primates uh, uh, go in for all these kinds of competition. Uh, here, male baboons are competing over an antelope carcass that one of them has captured. Here, males are competing over access to an estrus female. These are escalated forms of aggression. Females often can find themselves in competition over scarce resources. Sometimes it's food. Sometimes it's access to a particularly attractive infant. And in many species, dominance relationships, which are established between pairs of individuals, regulate priority of access. So it's not necessary to fight over every piece of food, but by establishing uh, dominance relationships, the outcome of, um, of, of encounters is highly predictable, and a certain amount of escalated aggression uh, is avoided. And dominance relationships are common in many primate species. The threat of conflict influences the quality of life in primate groups. Uh, a lot of conflicts that we see, particularly in the kinds of animals that I'm used to watching, uh, macaques and baboons, uh, seem to be unrelated to immediate access to resources. So we see a fight, and then you look around, and you try to figure out what they're fighting about. And you can't tell, and I don't think they know either. Um, a lot of the conflicts are unprovoked and unpredictable. Uh, they seem to come up from nothing. Um, and uh, I was quite taken with this observation, which I thought was uh, really quite novel. I'm quite proud of myself. And I wrote to Robert Sapolsky, who's an uh, all primatologist major source for all information about stress physiology. And Robert uh, kindly, very gently informed me that I had just rediscovered the, most, the best known fact in stress physiology, which is that unpredictable stressors are the most potent. And um, I began to think about this and to think about how it sort of played out in the lives of primates that I was familiar with, and I talked to some of my colleagues. And I've come to, to think, I've developed a hypothesis, that selection has favored randomly timed attacks on randomly selected targets precisely because randomness increases um, the amount of uh, um, stress on subordinates. It heightens the impact on the victims. You don't know it's coming. You can't prepare for it because you never know when it might happen. And at the same time, it limits the cost for the aggressor. You hardly ever have to go beat up on somebody because they're scared whenever they see you coming. And so um, uh, if baboons drove um, pickup trucks, uh, I'm afraid the bumper sticker would read, practice random acts of aggression and senseless acts of intimidation. But they don't, so we're spared that particular but. Okay, so if you live in a world of random violence, what should you do? Well, you should be pretty careful. Caution should prevail. Uh, you should be somewhat uncertain and concerned about others' intentions. You might be wary of potential threats. Uh, this, if you're uncertain and wary, this creates tension and avoidance. And this prevents peaceful interactions. So on the left, you see a high-ranking female named Sylvia who is a terror. She is not a nice lady. She fights a lot. So when she approaches Rosie, who has a newborn infant, which you can just see on her ventrum, it's uh, not, not great because it's not dark enough. But she has a newborn infant. Uh, this is her firstborn. So when she, all Sylvia has to do is approach. And Rosie's very concerned. Okay. Now, if Sylvia actually wants to touch this baby, which baboons, for reasons we don't fully understand, are really keen to do, they're really, really interested in handling other females' newborn infants. If Sylvia wants to be able to touch Rosie's baby, she's got to get past Rosie's fear. So... The female um, on your, on our right, I, I guess, um, uh, she's solving this problem. She's handling the baby of a very low-ranking female. She's touching the baby, and she's doing this because she's able to convince Cordelia that she isn't going to attack. 
So uh, the, the problem of living in this world of random violence has been solved, at least in some species, uh, by the evolution of signals that function as promises of or signals of benign intent, peaceful promises. So these signals facilitate friendly interactions. So when a female grunts to a female of a new infant, she, may, she is able to handle the infant. And she's able to do this because this grunt is a reliable predictor of benign behavior. It reassures subordinates, it reduces their avoidance, and it makes it possible for them to interact. Okay, now I'm going to show you some data. I'll walk you through it. Um, some people have to have chocolate on a regular basis. I feel that way about the data. Okay, so to convince you that these kinds of signals, at least in, in baboons and macaques, are honest signals of benign intent, let me show you some data from uh, rhesus macaques. These data are collected by my student, Betsy Caldor. Um, so on the left side, those dots represent the proportion of approaches that are followed by aggression when no call is given, when there's been no signal. Compare that with the frequency of aggression that's given when a grunt is given. So if you grunt, there's no aggression. So it really is a promise about benign behavior. If you grunt, no aggression. And these are, these are approaches by, by dominance who are a threat, potentially, to subordinates. So they seem to really promise benign behavior. And they facilitate friendly interactions. This is the proportion of approaches that are followed by uh, grooming in rhesus monkeys. So if you call on the right, you're much more likely to, so you approach and call. There's much more likely to be grooming after that approach and call than if no call is given. So they really do facilitate friendly interactions. And they also facilitate what females seem to love above all others, which is infant handling. So if you approach, if you're a baboon, a high-ranking baboon, and you approach and grunt to a lower-ranking female with a small infant, you have about a 57% chance of handling her infant. So of all the approaches and grunts that we observed, about 57% of them were then followed by infant handling, which the um, uh, females are strongly motivated to do. If you approach and you don't grunt, if you approach the mother of a new infant and you don't grunt, you're very unlikely to be able to handle her infant. So you go from 57% of the time to 6% of the time. So these grunts facilitate infant handling, which is an interaction which mothers tolerate but don't really like. They really not, don't want this to happen. And they would probably, they would prefer to avoid it. And if they're not reassured about the intentions of the higher ranking female, it doesn't happen. So then the question is, why do grunts create trust? Grunts are what we call cheap talk. And cheap talk means, you know, you know, that usually means that it's, you know, it's easy to say these things. I'm giving up, you know, I'm giving up chocolate forever, right? Or I'm going to clean my room soon. I hear that one a lot. I'm going to clean my room just, just after this program is over, I, you know, okay? That's cheap talk, right? Because it's not necessarily followed up by any consequences. And what we've learned about the evolution of signaling in the, in, in the last couple decades is that the honesty of signals is maintained by their cost. So in order to be honest, a signal is meant to be costly and hard to fake, hard to fake. So you can't, you know, so how do we get cheap talk? Well, we've done a little modeling uh, work, and um, we can show that cheap talk works when lying is an unprofitable long-term strategy. Okay, so most of the modeling is about interactions between individuals that meet once and don't know each other. Okay, but here we have a situation in which individuals are going to meet over and over and over again. Okay, so the reason that when my daughter says, I'm going to clean up my room in 10 minutes, that doesn't really work on me is because I've heard that before. Okay, so what maintains uh, the honesty of these low-cost signals, which would seemingly be quite easy to fake and lie about, uh, is that individuals 
interact repeatedly in these groups, they can remember what happened before, right? Oh, you grunted, then you bit my baby. And you can modify your behavior in response to those interactions. That's not going to work anymore. So in a situation which, when it's unprofitable strategy, when it's more valuable to be able to interact peacefully over a long period of time, because you're going to meet many, many times, than it is to cheat in this one interaction, these kinds of cheap talk signals can actually be stable. So that's why this kind of signal can work. Okay, so I, my way of thinking about this is that we can also extend this general kind of reasoning to what happens after conflicts in primate groups. And the problem with conflicts is actually kind of interesting. And again, you can reflect on, uh, you know, consult your own intuition about this. You know when a fight starts, right? You can tell. But it's not always clear when it's over. So imagine you might have had a uh, uh, dispute with your partner, okay? You know they're pretty mad at you right now, and, you know, you do what you do, you go on, you know, go to work, you come back, and the question is, are they still mad? That's hard to know. So you make these little conversational forays, right, to see how mad they might still be, you know? Are you listening to see if the doors are still being slammed, you know? That kind of stuff. Anyway, this uncertainty creates a certain amount of anxiety, Right? You're a little bit concerned. And I think this is exactly, we know this is what happens in primates. And so these signals of benign intent, these peaceful promises, could also allay anxiety in the period after conflicts, right after fights. And uh, they could also facilitate peaceful context in after fights. After all, if somebody's just beat you up and then they approach you, um, you might not be that happy to sit there and wait to see what might happen next, right? But if they really want to groom you or touch your baby, that's an unfortunate situation because there's uncertainty about what will happen. So I want to argue that these signals of benign intent folk, uh, uh, work in a very similar functional way uh, after conflicts as they do in day-to-day -day, uh, interactions. Okay, so the first thing... Uh, that various studies of conflict in primates that uh, Franz talked about last night, uh, what, I'm not, what various studies can show is the post-conflict period is sort of dangerous. So if you look to see what happens in the minutes that follow a conflict, you can see that the actual, uh, what happens after conflict is sometimes more conflict, okay, because they're really not done. Um, and this is a graph that uh, uses a slightly different method. So we look at the average rate of, um, of, of different kinds of interactions during a 10-day period before a particular fight, a 10-day period after a particular fight. That's a typo. It should say the white bars are 10, 10 days afterwards. And then 10 minutes right after the conflict. So we have got the 10 days before, how did things go? Right after the fight, how did things go? And then over the next 10 days, how do they go? And you can see that they make a lot of approaches and these peaceful uh, calls right after fights, but they also fight quite a bit after fights. So this is a dangerous time. This is, a, a, this is something females really need to be concerned about. And females are anxious in the post-conflict period. And this is something that's been well documented at a number of different sites. These data come from a study of baboons uh, um, uh, by Duncan Castles. Um, and he studied um, a, a form of behavior that's reasonably well correlated with internal measures of stress. So um, uh, again, consult your intuition. So what primates do when they're nervous and uh, uncertain and anxious is they kind of scratch a little bit, stuff like that. You'll never, you know, they have these things called self-directed behaviors. So they scratch, they stretch, they yawn, and we do some of that as well. Uh, and that's reasonably well correlated with um, if you take blood and you measure levels of, of, of cortisol. So it's a pretty good proxy without actually having to take blood. And you see here that if you compare a match control period when there's been no fight with a period um, just after a fight, the levels of self-directed behavior just after that fight go up quite a bit. Okay, but if in the post-conflict period there's one of these signals of benign intent or some kind of peaceful contact, 
an approach and a peaceful contact which functions to resolve conflicts, stress levels go way down. So contact uh, alleviates the anxiety that females feel after conflicts. In, uh, again, these are data from baboons from work we've done in Miramie. Um, they also facilitate peaceful interactions amongst females. So if a female uh, has fought with a lower ranking female, then the high ranking females approaches the lower ranking female and grunts, she has a pretty good chance of handling that infant. But if she doesn't grunt, she's got no chance of handling that infant. And at the same time, if she approaches and grunts, she's, less, she's much less likely to supplant her, the, the former victim. And supplanting is a way of avoiding proximity to a dominant. So the, so the, the lower ranking female stays put. She's not so worried that she feels she has to leave. And also seems to be a peaceful promise that the, that the threat of actual aggression is virtually eliminated when these calls are made. Okay, a series of experiments confirm the effectiveness of grunts. So we know it's the grunt itself that has this function, not any other behaviors the females might be doing. Uh, Robert Seifarth and Dorothy Cheney, who are shown here in the field, uh, did, uh, made this um, observation by observing conflicts with and without post-conflict grunts. Then they play the aggressor's grunt to the victim, uh, and they observe the victim's response in the next 30 minutes. And they see a pattern that looks quite a bit like the pattern we saw with the behavioral data. If you get the reconciliatory grunt, you're more likely to tolerate the aggressor's approach, you're more likely to approach the aggressor yourself, and you're much less likely to avoid your former aggressor. And these are, of course, simulated reconciliations. Okay, so why do they do it? Why do they reconcile? Well, it reduces anxiety and stress, which has been well documented and discussed by Filippo Aureli and a number of his colleagues. Uh, another idea, which um, uh, was one of the uh, other ideas that Franz alluded to, is actually an idea that I've worked on, which is that uh, I think that it, it's very effective as a means to an end. It facilitates immediate contacts with former opponents. Or, and or, it might repair damaged social bonds with former opponents. Okay, so these are three um, complementary um, uh, uh, hypotheses, uh, I tend to think that one and two are about, are most of the functional story. Okay, so again, conflicts have clear beginnings and unclear endings, uh, and if uncertainty reduces, uh, creates stress, uh, then we might predict that you'd reconcile more when that uncertainty uh, was greatest. And there is variation across species in the level of uncertainty about what will happen after conflicts. Uh, so uh, uh, we predict that they'd reconcile more if the conflict is actually undecided uh, and uh, perhaps if opponents are close in rank. And there's data to suggest that's the case. There's also data that macaques with relaxed hierarchies, remember uh, Richard just mentioned these differences in the style of aggression in um, macaque groups. Uh, there are macaque species in which subordinates uh, feel fairly okay about threatening um, uh, dominance. Uh, and that's true of Tonkin macaques. And then at the other extreme, there's rhesus macaques where this hardly ever, ever ha happens. They never do that. And baboons, they really never, ever do that. So if you look at the proportion of aggression versus higher ranking animals here, so the more rigid the rhesus macaques are far to the left, the more relaxed monkeys are, far to the, are on the right, the proportion of conflicts reconcil reconciled increases. And I think that's because there's more uncertainty about whether or not uh, one of the, the subordinate party will actually retaliate. It could happen, right? So you, everybody's a little bit nervous. So you have to reconcile more because of this. And it's really clear, I think, that facilitation, the reconciliation facilitates interactions right now. So uh, females uh, uh, reconcile with the ones they want to interact with and that they interact with the most. Kin, close associates, and mothers of newborns, even if they don't have particularly close relationships to those females. So our data here, we've plotted uh, the rate of infant handling per hour and the reconciliation rate. And you see these two things go together. So 
during periods when infants are very young and females are really, really keen to handle them, females reconcile those conflicts. And I think they do that because that's a means to an end. They, although we've just fought, now I want to handle your baby. You don't want me to, so I'm going to have to reconcile if I want to do that. So it's a strategic use, a tactical use of reconciliation. These are sophisticated social animals, a, a sophisticated uh, adjustment of behavioral strategies in relationship to desired outcomes, which in this case is handling infants. Uh, and and another, the, I, I have to tell you, by far the prevalent view is that females may reconcile to repair damaged social bonds. And the idea here is that relationships are valuable, conflict damages relationships, reconciliation reinforces and restores bonds, and so we observe that rates of reconciliation are high among partners with strong social bonds. I'm not convinced by this explanation. I'm not convinced that the, that the immediate cause of the behavior is to repair the social bond. I think it's plausible that animals who can manage these short-term problems effectively and are able to interact effectively and build strong social bonds, I think those animals may definitely have a selective advantage. I think social bonds are extremely important. I could talk about that for an hour, but I won't. Um, but I am skeptical about the idea that that is the, proc the, the, um, that is the selective force that's favored this behavior. Uh, that may seem like a subtle distinction. Um, I think it's actually an important one. But I do think that, um, that these things are complementary. I think the ability to resolve conflicts uh, may certainly function in adaptive ways to facilitate social interactions among individuals, and that is part of what allows primates to develop strong social bonds, which we now have a growing body of evidence to suggest have great adaptive value for individuals. So competition is a source of all of this. Conflict is ubiquitous. There are promises of peaceful behavior that create trust. I know, I'm confident that after this signal, it will be okay. Nothing, you know, I won't get hurt. And the reconciliation has immediate effects on individuals' ability to interact in peaceful ways. Thank you very much. collection, uh, we don't have that data, but there's been quite a lot of work on uh, differences in reconciliation rates by across age and sexes. Uh, that literature isn't very consistent, um, and it doesn't seem to follow that in, uh, you would think that in the phylopatric sex, like females and macaques and baboons, it would be much more important to reconcile because uh, they have stronger social bonds, but I don't think the literature supports that terribly well. Um, although I don't think it's been, I'm not convinced that we know, uh, that we've collected enough data on, uh, uh, on the various sexes and in various combinations to be very confident about that. Yes? That's a great question. I've spent a lot of time thinking about that because I've collected a lot of data on that question. My hypothesis based on all the data that I've analyzed and looked at is, is that um, I think their hormones make them do it. So if I look at my baboons and actually my macaques as well, um, uh, oddly enough, fem well, maybe not oddly enough, females who have the infants of their own are really interested in other females' infants. And I think that, um, I think a general attraction to infants, this sort of natal attraction, I think is part of selection for making mothers good moms. So, I mean, I mean, again, you've all had this experience. It's not that fun to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go pick up a baby and, you know, and, you know, cuddle it back to sleep, right? So 
but it would be really maladaptive to get up and, you know, hit it, right? We don't want to do that. So, so how do we get over the constant irritating annoyance of, um, of our own babies? Well, we just think they're wonderful, right? We just love them to death. I mean, you know, that, you know, babies and dogs. Um, uh, and I think that that selection has made us really um, attracted to this stimulus. We think they're cute. We want to touch them. Um, we want to look at them. I mean, you do this. You go in the, oh, I don't know, I do this. Um, you know, you're in the grocery store. You see a baby in the, in the stroller. You've got to look. And I don't want to take that baby home. I mean, if somebody offered it to me, I, you know, I'd say, no, thank you. Um, but we're powerfully motivated to look, touch, and be interested. And I think it's part of selection for making us, particularly females, good, solicitous mothers. That's my best, my best guess.